Well, good evening to you, and welcome to our class, and uh, I hope you uh, picked up some notes as you came in the door. If not, I have a couple here that I could share with you, if you didn't. Uh, but looking forward to tonight, and uh, let's start out with a word of prayer, and uh, ask the Lord to give us insight. Uh, uh, my friend over here said that he didn't almost didn't come tonight when he found out we were studying the book of Judges, and... Uh, I said, well, man, I was going to have you come up and teach it, in fact. <laughs> you begin to share out of your heart, and, uh, and most of you have a view of the book of Judges. I hope we change that view tonight and uh, give you a little more insight into what the Lord's trying to do with his covenant people, with his covenant people. Remember, these are, these are the continuation of the development of the history of covenant before the Lord. And uh, while, while this part of it is a difficult part, it's laying the groundwork more for what God really had in mind for his people. And we're going to go on. I think the last thing I said to you as you left last Tuesday was I, Wednesday, uh, I said to you, I'm going to show you a picture that you can use to really take, begin to understand even the rest of the Old Testament how it fits and how some of the history comes together with the prophets and the other people who are speaking into the lives of the people and hopefully gives you a framework to be able to talk about it. We're not going to talk about all that tonight. There's no way to do that, obviously, but we will lay the groundwork where we can talk the next few weeks, however many more weeks we have, uh, to be able to do that. So I've told them I can keep on going as long as they let me go. So got plenty to plenty to talk about so let's pray together father we just take this moment just to say thank you lord for your faithfulness and your love to us and who you are and what you do in our lives that that we can't even understand sometimes how you're leading us and yet in the spite of that we find ourselves walking in a way that you have called us to walk Lord, again, I believe that everyone here is, has a destiny and purpose in you that, that you have in your mind that you'd like to call, call them to receive all that you have for them. And Lord, whatever they're going through as we even talk about the things tonight, Lord, I ask you that the word of God would come to them in, as a covenant-keeping God, that you would show your great love and your great, great joy in seeing them develop and grow into the people that you have intended for them to be. And Lord, we just ask you, God, to do that in our hearts tonight as we look at these charts and we look hear the scripture and hear the stories out of the book of Judges and, and beyond as we un uncover what the Lord has said to him. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, that you might hear, O God, and that I might hear from you that which you've spoken to me and that which you've declared in the word of God. And we ask you in the name of Jesus to provide that truth. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, Book of Judges is a strong book in the scripture that is very real and very in between. You know, some people tell me about their trip across the United States, and I've actually said, used that phrase a bit, that we to get to wherever you want to go, you go through Oklahoma and Kansas and Iowa, you know, to get to wherever you're going. It's one of those states that's in the way of wherever you're going. And, uh, and uh, in some ways, some would, some would say the Judges is that, the book of Judges is that way. It's a, a book that's in the way of wherever they want to read and to understand what the Lord is saying. But I don't want to look at it that way because I have one big, one big premise that I want you to hear very clearly. This is the Lord dealing with his covenant people as a covenant-keeping God. And that's what we're going to see tonight as, as things happen and unfold in the book of Judges. We're going to see the covenant-keeping God. 
And that's what you can hear, and that's what you can understand for your life as we unfold the particular ways we're doing. So to do this, I want to do a little bit of review, but let's just make sure we understand where we are in the course. See, here we are. We've gone back now, and we've introduced an overview of the covenant. We've spent time talking about Abraham and the details, and we talk about the patriarchs of the faith, uh, Jacob and uh, Isaac and Jacob, and then we spent quite a bit of time talking about the, 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 the ministry and the destiny of his son Joseph that brought, brought such a, a place for the people of God to develop in Egypt for 400 years and become a nation in that environment of, as, as the Lord unlocked that door for them and introduced them in a positive way into that nation, ultimately to be driven out because they've gotten too big and too strong that they basically, uh, uh, the Egyptian people were afraid of it. And then we also then move to Moses. And you remember that the Mosaic Covenant was really had three big parts in it. You could talk about some other things that are other part of it, but, but the three big parts of it was he gave us the law. And the law became written and established that the people knew what the Lord expected his people to, to live and to what kind of a culture they would develop because they had spent 400 years learning the Egyptian culture and were very seriously indoctrinated by that. And now they had one night, they came out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. And that's what happened in the Sinai, is that we were learning God's culture rather than Egyptian culture and depending on God the provider rather than seeing the gods of Egypt as the providers. And so for 40 years, they began to be fed by the God of gods, and they would provide water by the, by the God of gods. Their clothing did not wear out. Their time, the place, the presence of God, and the, the freedom from sin that they learned through the sacrifices. We also learned about the priesthood and what was God was doing with the role of priest. And that one's such an important one because Peter tells us in his, in his writing, he says, we are a nation of priests is what God intends. And you and I are priests of the Most High God as we walk our lives. And so we need to understand what it is priests do. And he showed us very specifically about that. And then the third part of that was the tabernacle and the way into the presence of God. And we spent time on that and showing you how specifically God described that, that you might be aware of how to come into the presence of God. And then I overlaid it with the New Testament out with our bridge book, the book of Hebrews, that led us into the New Testament. And then we could begin to understand how to pray even in the tabernacle. I hope some of you are, are beginning to use that or are trying to use that, and the Lord will move in on that. If, if you're praying your way through the tabernacle, you're entering into the door with praise and thanksgiving, you're walking in the course with praise for his salvation and for his cleansing and his freedom that he brings you, and then you're going to the word and you see Jesus is the word, the fresh, clear word every day and, and see the Holy Spirit as it shines and hope you have received and understand that this is a multifaceted Holy Spirit that is shown through the tabernacle and is enjoyed by Christian people as they receive of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And then the altar of intercession, the place where I believe we are as a church and are as a nation of people who are worshiping God, we're learning about how to walk into prayer with intercession, given guidance by the Holy Spirit, supported and strengthened by the fresh word of God, and you come into that meaningful prayer time as you walk into there. And then last week, and I'm going to pick up with that tonight and really start about that, but I wanted to define just one word for you tonight, and that's the word judge. This term judge, we have a concept that we see the guy behind the court or we see uh, Judge Judy or somebody behind the court and uh, we have this view of what judges do. But the judge, his word, his, his word is from the Hebrew word shafat and it means a ruler or a deliverer. So this is essentially the kingship, the leadership, the authorityship 
wrapped up in a single word in the book of Judges that this was where the leadership from the people came from. And what we're going to see is this was very diverse and spread out and uh, there was no central judge. There was no central place where this was being done, which is laying the groundwork work for the people demanding a king is what's coming out of that. God uses judges in the moment in the book to deliver Israel from his enemies and to maintain justice and to settle disputes among the people that are going to come. And some of them, as we read the book of Judges, are pretty serious and pretty even uh, difficult to read how, how insensitive and ungodly people were living in that time as they chose to go their own way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to a little different format here for a minute and just let you, let you see that little different format. And I call it, I call it the rise and fall of Israel. And it's, it's a part of my study that I put together. We teach this class as part of our, our teaching and our pastoral training. As all these lessons are. These are lessons, you know, 13 through 22 is what these lessons are that we're talking about out of the course that we teach in our, our, our foreign school for pastors, and we call it the history of God's God and covenant history is what we call it. And I started with, you know, lesson 12, teaching you about that, and here we are at lesson 18, or in this case, we're lesson eight today, and talking about this class as the rise and fall of Israel. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce some things about that, and then I'm going to turn to a pattern that we introduced out of Genesis, but I'm going to go back to that pattern and use it in a new way just to talk about how Israel developed over time. And then I'm going to apply it particularly to the judges, and then we're going to apply it to Israel in general and begin to see how you can watch this pattern unfold as you read the Old Testament and, and read it with intelligence and, and bringing pieces together. And then the last part of it is the, the God's faithfulness to their nation, a nation of people that he's called and set apart. And so we're not going to end, end it that way. So let's go back and review some of the things we talked about. The last thing we talked about last week was... Well, let me see. Let me see. I don't keep up. I get to talking and don't <laughs> keep up. So somebody says, you know, thumbs up or something if I need to change this, you know. <laughs> I get so excited about talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But let's go back and let's look in the nations of the land again and, and understand what we were dealing with. So we came into the land of, of, of Israel. It was called Canaan at that point. And we had seven major nations that are talked about all the way through Exodus and through the writings of, 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 uh, of, of Moses and actually first are mentioned back in the Abraham covenant that the, these nations are named even way back there. But what we learned out that these people, even though they were named and spread out, the characteristics of these nations are very real. And I was talking to... I think I told you about a senior that I was talking in one of the senior centers that I go and teach three times a month uh, at one of the senior centers. And Dr. Bill, who was a childhood uh, cardiologist, he was saying, I love the Bible and I love the scripture, but why was he so hard on the existing nations? And I said, well, I can tell you why. And look at this that I said, their names meant their culture and characteristics were characterized by these things that I've listed here. Sons of terror, subliminal torments, phobias, terror, the Girgashites, the clay dwellers, they have a earthliness, they had little self-worth, they thought of themselves as poor and capable, incapable, mountain people, proud, and they would take them over, obsessed with earthly fame and glory and domineering, Canaanites, addictions and perversions and, and exaggerated people-pleasing. Oh, my goodness, does this, I didn't notice that one. That was this is abnormal psychology 101, isn't it? You know, because I'm describing things you and I deal with in our lives and we deal with in our Christian lives. We're talking about things here, limited vision, laziness, and low self-esteem, 
visions limit to an enjoying on earthly inheritance and not thinking of anything beyond that high hedonism. Oh, my goodness. We don't use that word very good enough, we, but we call it personal preference. That's what we call it, right? We call it entertainment. We call it VIP celebrities, you know, that are wrapped up in their daily hedonism that your headlines of every page, you can find something about someone that is living a lascivious life and enjoying whatever it is they do. And the Jebusites, the suppressors of spiritual authority, they basically didn't believe in, in a God, a strong God. They basically lived in legalism and in the d d developing their way of life. You remember one of the things I said last week that I had actually forgotten to tell you about the tabernacle is I encourage you, if the Lord reveals to you how full he is at the doorway or at the altar or at the lever of cleansing, don't stop there. Make sure you don't stop there. Because what you do is you become legalistic about that part of it. I know all about the altar, and that's not the right kind of sacrifice. You're not doing it the right way and not the right time. And by the way, I'm not even sure you're supposed to be here. You know, legalism brings judgment and destruction to those who are walking in a way of God that you don't receive. And by the way, the people who had the, next, the last wave many times are the most resistant to the next wave of God because they think they had it all. And they said, well, we, have, we speak in tongues, and that's all there is, right? You know, and once you speak in tongues, we have the fullness of that. Well, God has shown much more than that in the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, as he's revealed the truth of intercession, he's, he's true, tr revealed the truth of demonstration of what the power of God comes. So don't be resistant to the next wave just because you had the last one and you enjoyed it. And we can form all kinds of denominations around these things, right? And have. I've often wondered, you know, we call it Protestantism. I like to call it protestism, you know, you know that you basically are protesting about whatever else somebody did. And that's what is the division of our, well, now I'm getting into other things. But let me just show you this. Here was the problem. These people lived in the land, and they were sprinkled all over the land. And they were there, and Joseph came to drive them out because the Lord had said, clean out this land that we might have a, a clean environment to begin to build the people of God into the people that I want to enjoy and be able to do that. So we see all these people all the way from Dan way up in the north up there with the Hittites and the Gergesites all the way down to the Malachites, which had already chased them all the way across the Sinai and had a couple of battles with them. The Moab, oh my, think about, let me just make this how clear and unfortunate un, it is. Who are the Moabites? Everybody remember who the Moabites are? Yeah. Yeah. Remember the situation with Lot and his two daughters that they were afraid they were all the men on the earth were live were gone and so they basically had an ancestral relationship and out of that ancestral relationship the Moabites came. So you're talking about a very real I mean these are cousins if you would of Abraham and his people that are now their enemies, mortal enemies. Same way with the Midianites. Here's the Midianites. You know, what's, who are the Midianites? Well, that's Esau's sons. That's the sons that came from, oh, pardon me, no, it's Keturah's sons. It's actually Abraham's other's wife after he had Sarah. And after Sarah died, he married another woman, and Midian was born out of that. So they're even closer cousins even than Lot's children were. So you're talking about direct half-brothers in some ways with the children of, of, of Isaac and Jacob. So these people became the nations that they were doing. And so you're talking about a very real concept here. They'd already had a fight with the Amalekites. They'd already fight with the Moabites. They came up to the Ammonites. The Ammonites didn't let them go and wouldn't let them go through, so they had to conquer them. And then they came to Jericho and crossed over and began to go into the land. Now, here's the problem. 
the children of Israel settled in those same territories. Here you see Judah down in the bottom there, and Simeon and Reuben over on the east side of the Jericho River, and Gad and half-tribe of Manasseh to the north there. And they were into this same country. See, they were in the lands of the Amorites, and they were in the lands of the Hittites, and they were lands of the Jebusites, Ephraim and Manasseh there in the middle. You know, they're right in the middle of the Hittites and the Palestine and Canaanites. So you're talking about any residual culture of these people becomes a sinful temptation to the people of God dwelling in that land. So this is why God was saying, take them out. Don't leave them in the land. Don't let them stay. And what we see very quickly is they settled in the same territory and they got comfortable and they did not drive out the rest of the people. And they became a continuous temptation. And God in the second chapter of Joshua, um, in second chapter of Judges, basically says, you have forsaken me, you have walked away from me, I'm no longer going to drive them out by my supernatural power. You're going to have to do it in your own effort and your own choices to follow and seek after me. So these people stayed around for the next 300 years, and we get the book of Judges because they stayed around. And that is not fulfilling what God intended for his people to have because we see this kind of destruction. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back again. I, I'm a teacher, so I like to review, and I'd like to give you a final exam so you know the comprehensive final exam at the end. So you have all these lessons in your mind. Now, I'm not going to do that, but I, I'd like to. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to Genesis and let's talk about something that we learned from Pharaoh. When Joseph was in jail, had been there for 36 of his years, 36 plus of his years, he'd been through high school graduation when he was sold, you know, put in jail, and eighth grade graduation when he was sold into slavery, and then he'd been forgotten, so he had two more years in seminary where his special training and ministry was being honed and refined by the jailer and all the people that were there. And so he now comes into it, and we see that he went to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said a very important thing. He said, these two dreams that you're having about cattle and wheat, and paddle, cattle and grain, the two dreams are one. And they have three parts. They have a part of great expansion. For seven years, we saw the expansion and time, time of abundance. And then we went to the next seven, and we saw a great time of loss and a great time of famine in the land that would destroy essentially the existing government if anything wasn't done. And then the last part that Joseph pointed out, the real issue is what's the recovery after? So what are we going to do after all of this to be able to take the next steps? So here we are coming into this. So let's look at this again. And here we see I, again, show Joseph's eye up there at the corner in the left end. And if you don't recognize that, that's an eyeball. Yeah. Could, you, <laughs> could you go with me on that? All right. A little eyeball here. And, yes, he saw the period of expansion. And, yes, he saw the period of downturn. But the real thing he saw was the period of recovery afterwards. And this is why, why, why Pharaoh would listen to him because he's talking about the saving of a nation, the redemption of a nation, and going through this time to bring it to the fulfillment. So all of these were the same picture. Now, let's bring this into what we're talking about here. Let's talk about the development of Israel, and let's lay the same picture over the top of the, lever, the, the development of Israel. And what we know is that the first thing that came along was this powerful ministry and covenant expression spoken to Abraham about the family of God, that you will have a land, you will have a people, and you will have the presence of God. Wow. What more could you do, right? And so we began to put that together, and then we saw Joseph in Egypt as a next development of that, that gave them a place to develop their, their, their family. 
And then they, the Exodus under, on, in the books of Deuteronomy, of, of, of Exodus to Deuteronomy, we, we talked about the whole part of, of the Exodus from Egypt. And then the land of Canaan was conquered. And Joshua and his people went in there in the books of Joshua, and we conquered the land. So now we're in the beginning of the building of the nation was being built. And this is a beautiful picture up till this point. But what we see is with that came a change. So I'm going to blow it up so you can look at that quadrant of the curve a little better and see it a little bit better. But those same things that we're talking about, we add another one on top of that says, after Joshua died, the nation stopped following God. And what we see that is about 40 years that Joseph or that, uh, that Joshua lived after going into the land and he'd taken over and conquered and built root truth. But now it was the time for the people to take over and they very quickly. So, so you begin to read things like that. The children of people, I've led you out and, and I no longer followed God. So the people served the Lord all the days of jo Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. And this is in 2.7, if you're following in your scripture. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, died, and when he was 110 years old. So he'd lived, after going into the land, he'd lived a long time. And when all that generation died and they buried him and here in this mountains of Ephraim and all the generation that had been gathered to their fathers, another generation came after who did not know the Lord. You remember in Egypt, our story, uh, the first verse of Exodus, there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And it changed everything. And here we see they did not know the Lord. Now, I could stop if I was teaching Christ's kingdom and the family, which is one of the courses that we teach. I would stop on this verse right now, and I would talk about training your children. I would spend hours and minutes, uh, minutes and hours and days even, talking about what it is to train your children for the next generation. But that didn't happen. They didn't pass it on. So they did not know the Lord nor the works which he had done for Israel. And you say, well, how could they have forgotten all that? How? It was such an important part, such a critical part, crossing the Red Sea, crossing the Jordan River, the conquest of the land, all the nations around them, and they basically begin to live unfaithfully at that point. So I want to show that, and by the way, I was praying about all this this weekend on, as well we were on the men's retreats. And while I was enjoying and appreciating the ministry that was going on there, I was also thinking, how do I say this to you to help you understand pictorially what's going on here? So what I've decided to do is I said, okay, let's show that little sine wave there. For about 40 years after Joshua lived, they lived very effectively. But now they begin to lose and they, they declined. And that was the pattern that if we saw that over the rest of the book of Joshua, that's what it looks like. Up and down and up and down and up and down and, and up and down. Let's go look at it a little more detailed now. Let's look at it. So here we see that Joshua came and at the end of his life, there arose his partner, Caleb, who had gone with him initially as the spy in the land some 80 years before that, and his son-in-law, Othniel, had basically become a leader and a judge in the, in the days after Joshua. So God heard their pride. So, so let, let me just look at these. In 3.9, we see what's prompting all this. In chapter th 3 of Judges, 
and it says, Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served that king for eight years. But now, here's verse 9. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer and brought them and delivered them Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So you're talking about this man that was part of the original group that came out of Egypt as a young boy, he married Caleb's daughter, actually, and lived in the, the inheritance that Caleb had received, and we could read about that in chapter 1. And we see that he came and provided the deliverance and was able to, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Ju- Ju- Israel. He went out to war and the Lord delivered the king of Mesopotamia into his hands, and his hand prevailed over Cushan. Uh, uh, over the king, and and the land had rest for 40 years. So here we are down here. For 40 years, we're having rest. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, thank you, Lord. You healed him again. Isn't that we're, we're going to serve the Lord. But he died. And so all of a sudden, the people begin, the children of the Lord again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, remember Moab? Who's Moab? He's the descendants. His brother, cousin, you know, Joseph's wife came from Moab. That's where she came from. So these were close people. So you're looking at, here we have, and the Lord heard their cry and sent another man, a man named Ehud. And Ehab came in and was able to deliver them and bring peace into the land. And God led them until Ehud died. And so at that time, they basically, the enemy came in again and hit another trough. And so here we have, along comes Deborah and Barak. Now, this is an interesting story when you read about Deborah. How many know the story of Deborah? ladies that have been to ladies groups and they talk about the ladies of the Bible I'm sure Deborah is one of the ones that they would teach about because she had a wonderful idea and a wonderful attitude and a, and a serving way she could have taken leadership but she knew that God didn't want her to do that and see so she said to Barak her one from Naphtali. See, I wish I could go back to the other map and show you what part of the regions these people were in and why they were fighting the particular people they were fighting. Because they're way up in the north now where Naphtali, the nation of Naphtali lives. And she called Barak from Naphtali and she said, if you will lead the war, the Lord would give you victory over the army. He said, oh no. I'm, I'm too afraid. I, I, I'm not trained in war. I don't know anything about that. You know, I can't take over. You know, what can I do? And she said, if you will go, I will go with you, and the Lord will be with us. So here we have Deborah the prophetess walking in the ways of the Lord and, in fact, brought victory over the enemy, in that case, the the. The Canaanites were the ones that they were fighting, and they're basically establishing the life together without the Canaanites. And so she rejoices, and I don't know if you've read chapter 5 of Exodus, of um, not Exodus, of Judges. Uh, Again, read chapter 5 of Judges, and you see a song of rejoicing. Because why? Because God kept his covenant with his people. He brought them out of the peril of their lives. And for another 40 years, under their leadership, they were able to have peace in the land and be able to understand that God had met them again. So we're talking about, again, this step. And then we go on for another time and we read about Gideon. Gideon is a powerful prophet and a powerful person after the Lord touched him. 
What was his first response when, you remember what he was doing? He was hiding down in the wine press, trying to grind a little bit of wheat to provide food for his family because the Midianites, again, the cousins of Abraham's other wife, were now causing problems for all the children of Israel that were living in the land, and they were basically stealing their crops. Every time the crop would get ready, the Midianites would come along and harvest it, carry it off. And they were left with poverty and famine and suffering, and basically Midianite was hiding down there trying to grind some wheat. And the Lord said to him, what did he say? Everybody remember what he said? How did he greet him? said, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And uh, Gideon looked around and said, I wonder who he's talking to. I told you the other day morning in prayer meeting that Aaron Brown, one of the men's leaders here, and that it was, we were having a prayer time in Wednesday morning prayer. And, uh, and our, as our pattern is, lots of people can speak up and share scripture and, you know, you know, and then we can pray about things. And, and so I shared a, a bit of a thought that I was having. And he said, he looked right at me and he said, well, Terry, why don't you pray us into that? And I, and, and I looked around and, I, you know, and I looked behind me and I think you were behind me, Josh. And I thought, that's not his name. You know, I don't know. And I said, well, um, I'd be glad to pray into that. My name's not Terry. So I felt a little bit like Gideon here. Gideon, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And he said, who are you talking to? And remember who he was. He was right in that middle part of Israel where the Canaanites lived and where the Midianites came in from the east and where the Hittites came down from the south and where the Girgashites were up there and the Hivites came up from the, from the, from the north, uh, well, the north, that north. And he was there and he said, who are you talking to? If the Lord is with us today, what happened to all the stories we heard about? The Red Sea and the Jordan River and the conquest of the land. Didn't the Lord bring us out of Egypt? Where is he? And the Lord turned to him and says, Go in the might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hands of the Midianites. And he said, Oh, my Lord, how can I save anybody? Indeed, my clan is the weakest. Manasseh, that's the son of Joseph. Remember? Ephraim and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph. But he considered man, Manasseh, the weakness. Because they didn't have the power of the Lord that the tribe of Judah had. And they didn't have the power of the Lord that even Ephraim had, his brother. If you remember, Manasseh was the oldest son, and the Lord had not blessed him. He blessed Ephraim instead. So lots of history goes into that one little sentence that you're reading there. He's saying, he's saying, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Now, you remember when we were talking about the call of, see, as a teacher, I like to remind you of all these past lessons so they build these into you. You remind us of the story of the call of Moses. What did I say? Four questions, right? That Moses asked immediately. Who am I that you should send me to try to deliver the people out of Egypt? And the Lord says, I'll go with you and I'll be with you. And, and here we see Gideon saying the same thing. Who am I that you send me? And the Lord says, well, I'll be with you. And you remember Moses' response. Well, I, I'm really glad... Uh, you're going to be with me, and that's wonderful. But who are you? What's your name? And God says, I am who I am. I was who I was. And I will be 
who I will be. And here to Gideon, he's saying the same things. I, if now I find favor in your side, then show me a sign. And what did Moses do? He said, okay, I, I believe you. You'll be with me, and you sound pretty powerful. But how am I convinced all those buddies in my back there that I'm really sent from you? Give me a sign. And the Lord did. Gave him three signs. The sign of his hand and in his leprosy. He lived, put, came out leprous, and he put it back in, and it was healed. He took the water and dumped it on the ground, and it turned to blood. And he took the snake and threw it down. I mean, the king, his, his shepherd's rod and threw it down, and it became a snake. And he picked it up, and it began a rod again. So the same thing Gideon went through here, and he said, how can I know that you've really led me? How can you spoke with? And the, and the Lord let him go through that. Oh, can you hear this covenant-keeping God? He's willing to work with our disbelief. He's willing to say, come on and go take the land. Take your family. Take your business. Take your city. Take your church, take your, the things that I want you to take and bring the message of the gospel in a way that will bring redemption to lots of people. And you're saying, how do I know I can, you can do that? Do you have the power to do that? And Lee, he let Gideon do this very specifically as he unfolded the fleeces. Remember the fleece? The first night he put it out and he said, Lord, keep it dry and the rest of the ground wet. And he said, well, that, that worked pretty good, but you know, let's do it different this time. Let's do it, make the fleece wet and the ground dry. And the Lord says, okay. And he did it, and he led him into the battle against the Midianites. I'd love to do a whole person study on the book of Gideon tonight. I mean, on the person of Gideon, just like I did in Joseph. I just happen to have a... 80 slides or so on Gideon, but uh, we won't do that tonight <laughs> because I think we only have a few weeks left to be able to talk about these things, and that would take at least another. But what I want to say is God met his people again when they cried out for help. They brought it with the signs and the wonder, the miraculous work, the, the, the power of God, and demonstrating the flow of God even to bring the destruction of the enemy. And then we see that for 40 years, they lived pretty happily again. And sure enough, along came another time. And, and the Lord raised up again Jephthah out of the tribe of Manasseh. So Gideon had shown him the way. This is the way to do it. And, oh, there's lots of intrigue we could read about. There's lots of evil in the book of Judges that you want to talk about. All of Gideon's sons were killed by, by, a, by a revolting leader. And conflict, and by the way, if God is leading you into anything meaningful, you're going to run into conflict. You can count on that. And conflict it can be serious at times and can be destructive at times because Satan does not want these people to be unified. They don't want a central judge. They don't want a central leader. They don't want the, the, a person that basically brings, brings unity. I keep saying to others about the church of today, I said, if we really understood how serious and how big the enemy is, we would overcome a lot of our differences to be able to fight together. But we're so hung up on our judgmental place of standing at the altar or standing at the lever of cleansing or standing at the at the word of god oh that's the wrong version you can't read that version that's not the translation that's not the authorized version how can you read that that's not going to give you good insight paraphrases you know oh, those are not trans those you can't use those that's you know those are those are not translated that's just somebody's good idea what the word says and yet insight comes out of those and god blesses and honors people and 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 so we're sitting there fighting about against the very things that God wants us to join together. 
to be joined by the other churches and the other people and the other Christian people everywhere. So I've laid this out on, on a table for you. Oh, I don't want to forget Samson. Let's not forget Samson. How could you forget Samson? He's probably, I guess there's probably three of these judges lots of people know about, right? One of them is Samson. One of them is Gideon. And I don't know what your other one would be. Who else knew about other judges besides Gideon and Samson? Well, Deborah, I would say the three. So if I would have said, who knows anything about the judges? How many would have said, yeah, I know three. Deborah and Gideon and Samson. Well, Samson's uh, an amazing story, isn't it? I want to spend just a little time on that. I, I don't want to take a lot of time on it. But I want to say this is a unique man. Raised up in a time of really destructiveness in the land where the Philistines had grown very strong along the coast. And if you read, if you read Judges, you would find out that the Lord left five cities in the land of Philistines where they were not drawn out and they were not led out. And so the five cities continued to offer problems all the way up through the life of David and into the even this time of Saul, of Solomon. So we're talking about a very strong nation that had brought destructiveness, and the Lord brought a very specially chosen person. Samson was born, and the, the, the situation of her, of, of, of this would be again a story of a man and woman who were childless, and all of a sudden the Lord came to them and said, we're going to give you a son, and we want you to raise him a particular way. So they raised him as a, as a what? A Nazarene, a Nazarite. Nazarites were raised with long hair. They didn't cut their hair. They didn't eat any meat. They didn't drink any wine. And they basically lived a life of holiness throughout their lives. And so Samuel, Samson was raised that way. And, it, and if you read this, you begin to read that the spirit of the Lord began to motivate him to do something about the trouble he saw. So he went down to the Philistine cities. And you remember last week when I showed the pictures of how the cities were civilized cities with lots of technology and lots of economy and lots of idolatry. He walked down there and he was immediately enamored by things he had not known before. As a Danite, let me just help you with this. Uh, those of you that, that have homeschooled your children, those of you that have protected your children through school, that's one of the fears you have, aren't they? That when they get out into the world, they'll be led astray by things that they did not see. And that if your homeschooling had a good solid foundation in the scripture and the spirit of the Lord, they'll do fine. And in fact, they'll do better than most because of their training and the, and the goodness of God. Stampson could have done better than anybody else because he not only had that close careful training but he had the spirit of the lord that came on him and brought forth and that's what you pray for your children at least i did for mine you know in the schools that were very parochial and part of our christian churches so we our children were raised in those but i said lord somewhere in their teenagers let them touch the holy spirit it isn't enough well, it is enough, I don't want to say it that way, that they just meet the Lord. I, I want them to be Christians and to know Jesus, but I really do want them to touch the Holy Spirit because it will change their whole attitude about how they see the Scripture, how they see God, how they see other people, how they see the call of God on their lives, and, they, and it changes. And I pray that for every one of our young people, that the Spirit of the Lord would go across our Sunday schools and our churches and touch those kids with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will live, change life. We were in a school, and, and they were talking about putting some more, more rules in place to get them to not do things. And my wife, Sherry, raised up. She says, let me just say something. Some more rules are not going to help anything unless there's a change of heart. And we need to pray that the Lord would bring the Holy Spirit into this school because we can't control them with some more rules. We need to, to, need to have the Holy Spirit touch their lives 
and change the way they see things. And I don't know where your kids are, but that was one of my key prayers for my three girls as they got into the adolescent years. Lord, let them touch the Holy Spirit during this part of their life so they walk through the rest of their high school time with knowing who God is and knowing who the Holy Spirit is. So you're talking about this kind of peace coming out of this truth right here. Danite, a very, he was of the tribe. He probably was, and I remember Danite, we showed on the map, was actually two places because they didn't like and they didn't have enough space and they couldn't kick the Philistines out. So they said, okay, let's just escape and go way north and live way out north. So there's two tribes of Danite, Danites who were living there. And they were probably in the southern one, which was down among the Philistines is where, where Samson grew up. And in fact, you know, looking at the map, we know that, that I have some teaching on that that I do about where Samson was. So you're talking about he was dealing with the Philistines, which were po probably the most technologically leaders. They had iron. They had chariots with iron wheels. They had shields and swords, and they had grind and wine presses, and they had ways to, gr to uh, grind their grain. They had big temples and big buildings and big schools and lots of wealth in their particular view. He went down there and he said, my goodness, let's look at all that, and isn't this wonderful? And he fell in love with, you know the story, a Philistine woman that basically tricked him into telling the secret of his strength, which was God-given, that was wrapped up in his fact that he'd been raised a Nazarite and did not cut his hair, and ultimately did that, and was captured and put in, put in prison, and that the Lord gave him a great victory even at the time of his death, that he wiped out more Philistines in that one party they were in than he had the rest of his whole life. And so God gave that back to him. But basically left the land without a leader. So here we are, a whole bunch of people coming on, and this opens up the story that basically starts in the book of Samuel is Eli is the priest that's the leader of the land. So here we've walked about 300, a little over 300 years through this period of time to see the kinds of things that God brought into the, into the land. Well, I'm going to go a little farther and talk a little bit more about out of the book of Judges and be, be able to go a little farther. But I want, first of all, I want to say, what happens to a land when they begin to turn against God? Oh, my goodness. You know, I, I, get, I read the scripture, and I, and I weep for our land. I know enough about the words of the prophets and, and some of them that we'll share, some of them. I, I say, this is today. That's what these prophets are writing about. This is what happened in the news today and in our cities, and, and in among our people, and our young people, and in our t entertainment, and, and all the things that we're doing, and our economy with our money, and businesses, and, and, and the exploitation of people, and all the kinds of things. These are all things that we can read, go read, you know, Malachi, and Micah, and, and Isaiah, and Jeremiah weeps for these kind of things as he watches what's happening to the nations. And he's watching it unfold, and he's raising his hand, don't you see, don't you see, don't you see? And they're saying, be quiet, go away, you know, tell your message to somebody else, we're not interested. So what happens? So here, let's look at this again. Well, that's your I gave you a table of all this in case you couldn't read all that. <laughs> you know, good, good teacher that I am, I want you to have information <laughs> that you can go home and meditate on. And, you know, I just, you know, just want to toss that in there almost at the last moment. No, no, I got this nice table. I'll go ahead and put it in there. <laughs> so that's what this one is. And the things I just said, you can read them for yourselves and and meditate on them and take them to the Lord and say, Lord, what do I do about this? And so, but what happens to a nation? Let's go back to my curve here. You do remember I'm a mathematician, so I do like curves and graphs and trends and things like that. So that's, I told somebody today that I drew this sine wave a long time ago and I don't remember how I did it actually. 
but you know the formula of it is pretty standard. You know those of you in trigonometry could draw one for me with your computer easily, but that's where it came from. So <laughs> that's how I got it on that side. Probably, I think my notes, first notes in this are probably 15 years old or more. So that's where it came from. So let's just look at this. So the nation was developing and pretty effectively. The nation was developing. In a positive nation, you begin to develop a workforce and you begin to build things. As we go into some of the poverty-stricken nations as our missions areas are done and some of our pastors are working among these people, they find out that if they can get some people working and some productivity and they can produce something they can build and sell and export and things like that, things begin to get better for the nations. You know, we were, we were in a men's meeting, oh, years ago, and we talked about talking about Congo, Congo, and at that point we had a missionary that had been there as a third-generation missionary already, and he was saying, what can we do for the economy of that land? Well, we figured out there's all kinds of things that they could export, you know, different kinds of oils and different kinds of minerals and different kinds of crops, and they began to do that, and sure enough, he went back and began to establish a whole coffee transportation and distribution system that impacted, I think, as I remember, over 40 churches were involved in that and had people that could begin to do something in that area. It, would been, it had been badly controlled by mafia and the illegal people, but they were able to do that and buy equipment and, and be able to do that. So they build the land and, 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 and become productive. And then begin to be as a leader in that area. See, I look at, you know, those of you that have been Africa, I look at the nation of Uganda as an example of this. As you remember, Uganda has come through terrible times of destructiveness, similar to what we were seeing in, in the time of Israel. And whole genocide of many, many, many people at a time and when that leader went away, God installed a man who knew about the Lord. And in fact, his wife was a spirit-filled believer and began to put things in place in Uganda that the nation could became a leader in that part of, of Africa. They were landlocked. They had the Nile River running through it, but that's a long ways down to the Mediterranean Sea. And so from Lake, Lake Victoria... The headwaters of the Nile start right there and basically go through not very far from where our school is in Kabul, uh, Uganda. So we watched this develop, and all of a sudden these entrepreneurial spirits begin to be rise in young men, and we're saying, how can we start a business? How can we start a business? I could sell this. I could do this. One, one guy had vanilla beans on, on his on his property, and he started importing vanilla. Well, somebody else knew about shoes and how to make shoes and set up a kiosk in a, in a shopping center. So we, so we begin to see the nation become a leader. And in that part of the world right now, Uganda is probably as peaceful a place and as productive a place as any other nation around them, even more than Kenya is because Kenya has gotten so interlocked with their political uh, – these, these are stories – that God know, uh, that I know about because I've been there and saw it, you know. But I want you to hear the what God does to a nation when they begin to turn to righteousness. Proverbs says, "When the righteous rule, people prosper and there's peace. And when the fool rules, people run and hide, and productivity dies and drops off. And then all of a sudden, they begin to be able to protect themselves from the enemies because they, they build the land and be able to do things. And once that starts, now you can begin to trade not just in your own land, but begin to trade internationally and to be able to do commerce. So can you tell that I have a little bit of economics in my thinking? You know, I, in fact, I had to take out all the words that related to economics in these slides as I prepared these for today because I've used this course when I taught economics to be able to talk about this. So, but as a, as a nation begins to turn away from God, you hit the top of that, you hit the top of it, and you basically run out of, run out of, and you begin to drop. 
And what happens when you begin to drop? Your workforce becomes complacent. Let me see if I heard that word complacent in the last five days. Um, I think it, there was letters or something. I don't know what they stand for, UAW or something like that. That you know, uh, I don't know something and writers, screen and guild writers, and you know, and uh, yeah, people wanting to be paid by the government for doing nothing and and I don't know I'm sure that's really not happening loss of productivity uh, you know, economically you know about a word called gross national product our gross national product became negative for the first time in the last 10 years that it's ever been where we're sending more things out. I mean, we're sending things less uh, less out than we're bringing in. And so our balance of trade is negative. And what does that do to a nation? Well, it drives debt for one thing, and we'll talk about debt some other time, but, but debt's a very serious problem in a nation. So what else is going on? Marketplace closure. Oh, well, of course, that ever hasn't happened at all, right? You know? All those restaurants that you've gone to all these years are still just faithfully serving you. I'm being sarcastic. I'm sorry. Because it, it's not funny. It's painful to watch. Painful to watch what's going on in our nation right now. We're not to mass famine yet, but we are talking about food shortages. And we know in the world there's major famine in the world. The whole central part of Africa World Health Organization says that 50% of the population is going to die in the next 10 to 15 years out of lack of provision of food and, and the things that are necessities for life. And you're talking about that. So enemies come up against the nation. Whoa, <laughs> that's no problem in our world, right? Except it is a problem. And all of a sudden, we don't have the strength. We don't have the strength in what we're doing. And, and we're finding ourselves worried about enemies that we haven't worried about for a long time, ever in some cases. I said to my children 30 years ago probably, so I said, and that was at a time when I was doing some things that pretty advanced in our nation, and I knew some things about things that were going on. And I said, I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime uh, I don't think it's going to happen quite that fast. But China is going to be the nation that you're going to be dealing with in your life. And here we are 30 years later, and China is the nation that we're dealing with in many, many ways as we have made decisions of how we do business with them and how we treat them and what we've done to protect intellectual properties and patents and all those things that make our nation productive the way it is. So you're talking about very real things here as the enemies comes against the nation. And they begin to lose territory. In the case of Israel, they were losing borders land. It was being taken over by the Midianites and the Moabites and the, and the people around them, the Ammonites. The Ammonites had been conquered years before that, and now they're back. And 300 years later, they're back chipping away at the territory. And, and I don't talk about geographical territory. We haven't lost any de geographical territory, but how about our territory of our science and our arts and our technology and our education systems and our and our ways of building people in the ways of, of God. So we're talking about very real changes that come as a result of this downturn as things happen. Now why am I telling you this about the book of Judges? Because we're about ready to turn the page and the last thing that it says in the book of Judges says and in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Now, I don't know if you know have a word for that. The word for that is autonomy. That's a very revered word these days in our culture. Started out with one of the burger places said, have it your way. 
What is that? That's autonomy, as opposed to McDonald's across the street that says, have it our way or don't eat here. <laughs> and Burger Chef, I think it was, or Burger King, I guess, Burger King, basically said, you know, we can have a whole market open up to us by just offering options of onions and pickles and lettuce and tomatoes. But what is that? That's increasing. And then Sesame Street came along, right? Teaches our children. Be your own. Do it your own way. You're the one. You decide. And all of a sudden, I remember hearing parents disciplining their children, and they said, now, Sally, don't do that anymore. Okay? And I said, what's that okay on the end of that? Are you asking for their approval? I don't remember being asked that. You know, it was like, don't do that or suffer the consequences. There was no question about that. Are we doing this right? Child, am I raising you right? Oh, my goodness. How would they know? Because of personal preferences and personal pieces and personal choices that we've given as a way of life. So you didn't know judges was going to be this relevant to who we are as people in our nation right now. Well, let's go a little bit further. Lose territory and ability to defend themselves. They don't have enough money. They don't have the army. They don't have what's going on. I don't know what a government shutdown is going to do. But one of the pieces that is very real is all the people that are in our military that are affected by that. And I don't know what that's going to do, but I know this, that it's not going to make people happy. I think they're going to ask hard questions out of some of that. And what we're talking about here is very real pro procession of what's going on in our nation and other nations and around us. And unfortunately, this is now a worldwide problem, not just our country, because a worldwide economy is so interlaced in every way. All right, so let's go a little farther and take the next few minutes and just talk about God's fulfillment of his covenant. So let's start here, and we've seen some of this before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We saw all this, but we stopped right here. But here's the judges led for some period of time, and we see that, but then we begin the kings started in the book of Samuel, and we see Samuel, the, the leader and the, and the prophet who came, not as a priest. People don't realize that he was not of the priestly tribe, he, although he lived in the temple and acted in many of the roles of a priest, he was not a true Levite. So that's always been a very interesting story that the Lord was even bringing a God-honored person outside of the tribe of Levite because the tribe of Levites had become, during this period of time, they were sprinkled throughout these 12 tribes and they had become so corrupt in their dealing with people that God didn't, nobody believed them anymore. Their credibility was so poor that we don't believe the priest when he says this. And Eli was an example of that, or your sons. They're exploiting and doing damage to the people, and, and they've not been raised in the ways of God, and they're not serving, and people don't like them. And even Samuel, who was raised in that household because he had no father image in Eli to really understand, it said, Samuel's sons, you're not doing well either, and they're not serving the Lord. And, and so we're talking about very real things that happened that came out of this time of the early book of Samuel. And then we begin to see that the kingship was established in Samuel and first and second Samuel and also went on into kings and we begin to see more of that. But then came the height. David was made king and God's chosen man. He was a man after God's own heart. But he began to, to do things that were building toward a nation that would be a, a, a nation that would worship God. And his son, Solomon, was chosen. And the last two Sundays, we've heard sermons about that. Adonijah, 
was one problem. Absalom was another problem. But Solomon was chosen to be king by David and anointed by God and started out his reign in a very God-fearing, faithful way. And so we begin to see that the temple was built, which was kind of the, the first part of this that where God chose for the first time since the tabernacle days to come and dwell in the midst of the people. And people would know the presence of God and would know that there is a God in Israel and there is a God in Jerusalem and he is bringing forth that which is due. And out of that came a period of, of national proper prosperity that was unsurpassed maybe ever we don't know how to measure that obviously there's been very wealthy nations over the years but this is an example of god bringing a prosperity based on all the pieces that he'd providenced with his covenant and his covenant was filled fulfilled all the land that he had brought had promised abraham was taken over and controlled by david and that kind of covenant fulfillment allowed people to understand there really is a God in heaven who spoke way back to Adam and way back to Abraham and way back to Moses. And now in our life, he's basically spoken through David and the Davidic covenant that said you would always have a son on the throne that becomes the redeemer, the ultimate king of kings and lord of lords. So you were talking about this kind of piece of what the Lord would say to us. Let's look at this in a little more detail, can we? I, you know, again, I'm a teacher, I'm digging down and going further. But let's just, this is, you know, I trimmed the top off of my parabola and uh, my sine wave, so I give you this picture to be able to show you this. But we, here we see Samuel providing leadership in God honored that leadership, and people responded to it. And the nation of Israel, for the first time in 300 years, were now listening to one voice in Samuel. But they were unhappy because Samuel didn't go to war, and Samuel was only one man, and Samuel didn't raise sons that were remarkable. And so the people began to cry out for a king. And you remember that Samuel wept because he realized that God had given him the responsibility for these people and he was going to God and drawing from the Holy Spirit and saying, oh God, how can we fulfill what you've done and spoken to our land? And yet the people were saying, give us a king, give us a king, give us a king. And we heard that in a sermon by Jonathan recently where he's talking about that he was weeping for his loss of leadership and the loss of respect that he was receiving. But God said to him, don't weep, Samuel, for yourself. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting me because they don't want to just listen to the voice of the Lord. They haven't done it for 300 years now in the land. They did it only marginally under Moses' teaching. But for 300 years now, they've gone their own ways, and they basically don't know. And now it's time for a king to be appointed. And the Lord says, give him a good-looking king. I used to call Saul the, the head and shoulders man because he was head and shoulders over everybody else. And those of you that use shampoo know there's a shampoo called head and shoulders. And, you know... <laughs> And I thought that was a good game for the name for this guy, the head and shoulders, Saul, the head and shoulders man. And so he was a handsome, strong looking, but we know that he had a very weak heart and a weak faith and, and worried about his own leadership capability. Self-esteem, we would just, I mean, us psychologists, we would, we would diagnose immediately. He had self-esteem problems and self-worth problems, and, and he had a, you know, probably a dysfunctional family orientation and all those things we'd put in labels. But he didn't turn to the Lord fully, ever. And so the Lord rejected him and brought David. And that only aggravated the problem and made it even more difficult. But David basically was chosen and anointed by Samuel. Saul was, and then David was also. He dis Saul disobeyed and 
And now David was anointed by Samuel the prophet. So David rules over all of Israel. Then Solomon becomes king, and as I mentioned, the temple is built, and it becomes an important part of all of this. And so here you have, and I think I'm going to end with this picture, that the temple was built in the nation of Israel. And that Solomon's temple became the focal point for the next several years of his reign, another 40-year reign of Solomon. He led his people, and this became a, a, a showplace of the earth, became an economy that was modeled, became a people that were happy and excited and, and responding it to it. And so we begin to see that the that the, the time had come when we, we would see the fullness of God's measure in the land. However, we know the story. And the rest of the story will start next week when we come back. But the be- rest of the story is a sad story of what S- Solomon really introduced, three things, into the nation that at the time seemed, oh, okay, so that's what you're doing but they became the threads of destructiveness of the nation of Israel. Three things. Idolatry, introduction of foreign wives into their culture. What happened? They brought with them the culture that was not godly culture. They trained their children that way. They led them in the ways that that were different and Egyptian in one sense, other nations around them, and because of Saul's hedonism and his response he also introduced materialism as a major aspect of how people lived always coveting and needing and spending and 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 trying to have more which we'll talk about that you know in times forward too but that's in our nation a very serious part of our nation is how materialism People who meet the Lord in, in, in uh, China and in India, they say, oh, Lord, keep us from adopting American capitalism because it's so destructive. And it does change people's lives and goes back to the garden with the issue of comparison. My car is better than your car. My house is bigger than your pair. I have more clothes than you do. I have more money. I have better everything. And that becomes... Good and evil measured, just like Eve learned about, and somebody dies when it happens. You're not the right size. You're not the right color. You're not the right shape. You're not the right right opportunity. You're not the right language. You're not the right ethnic. That becomes death and starts wars and starts destructiveness because just like with Eve, it says the comparison of the knowledge of good and evil brings death. And that's the issue that we're still facing. Well, I hope this has been helpful. And I hope it's unlocked some things to think about. And I don't know about you, but I I find myself at the end of this study wanting to fall on my knees before the Lord and say, Oh, God, I repent of not standing against the kinds of things we've talked about and I haven't, I've even allowed them into my own lives and, and made it a part of our life. And, and oh God, oh God, can, can you restore to us a joyful salvation and a clean heart? Can you restore unto us the, the, the ways of salvation and bring us to a place of repentance? See, God brings repentance Romans tells us that is therefore now no condemnation from God, but there is conviction. But conviction is solvable. See, condemnation leaves you to shame and 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 guilt and bitterness and the destructiveness of bitterness. But <clears throat> conviction leads to repentance. Oh Lord, that's another part of me. Let me nail that one to the cross, too. Let me receive the salvation in that part of my life. Let Take that away and let me receive of the, of the purposes of God in that part of my life. So 
I don't know about you, but that's where I am. And if you want to stand together, let's, let's pray together about the repentance for the kinds of things that we've seen tonight that sound an awful lot like things we're experiencing. And out of that would come the destructiveness of the enemy instead of the redemption and the glory of God into his church and to his people. Just pray in your own way for a minute, whatever you want to do. and Tell the Lord what, you, what you'd like to say or what you'd like to do. If you have questions or comments that you want to make, there is another microphone here. And if you want to make a comment about what you're seeing or hearing tonight, that'd be fine. Anybody want to do that? Anybody want to make comments about what you're seeing or hearing tonight? Yeah. I think I'll, I'll speak back to you what I think you've been saying over these uh, several weeks. And um, I think what you're telling us is that, that I don't know how to say it. Um, that, that God is the faithful one, right? The covenant keeping God. Yeah, right, right. That um, that God puts Abraham to sleep while He makes the covenant. That's right. right. That um, it's just I'm just more and more convinced that I, I, I don't even know how God is strong enough to save us. Yep. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm not worried about that. Sorry. <laughs> God is strong enough to save us. Yes, He is. I don't know if that's helpful, but. Appreciate the comment. Anybody else want to say anything? Come on, some of you speakers. <laughs> Tell us what's on your heart. Well, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the privilege of knowing you. And thank you for the unfolding of your scripture. And Lord, if we felt your convicting power tonight, Lord, that's from the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, we know that you don't bring guilt and shame. And if there is guilt and shame, Ms. Lord, you have delivered that and you've taken that on the cross with you because you want you to understand that at the altar of sacrifice, you did the full job of atonement for our iniquities and our untruthfulness and our, our unwillingness, our blindness, our lack of healing. All of these came from the atoning work of God that came through Jesus Christ. And as a covenant God, you've unfolded it to these people for, for this thousand years now that we've talked about from, from Abraham to David. We've talked, oh God, the, the way that you've led these people in the, into your ways and your truthfulness in the name of Jesus. And thank you for that and thank you for the word of God to us tonight. And we ask, Lord, that we go out and, and rejoice in the fact that we can count on you when we cry out and say, oh, God, deliver us, even from our own sinfulness. Deliver us from sin our sinfulness. You would send the deliverer, and you have sent the deliverer in the Lord Jesus Christ who brought healing to us and the destructiveness of, to our en enemies in the name of Jesus. And we give you thank you. Thank you for that and praise you for it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, who made it all possible that we can even stand here in the joy of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, go in peace and uh, let the Lord direct you what you would go. Hope. <laughs> yeah, we will finish this packet. I, I didn't know how fast I was going to talk tonight, so I put some things in here that went beyond what we talked about tonight. But we'll pick that up and we'll go from there. Thank you, Lord. I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, we do have passed out notes if you need something, by the way. Yeah, I'll do.
Oh, you haven't seen it. Let's see this. Let's see. Let's see what we got. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see what we got. 